Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, joined today by Mario Vasilescu, who's the CEO and co-founder of a company called Readocracy. I've seen what they have going on. It's interesting. We're going to get into it. We're going to talk about credentialing. We're going to talk about media literacy and some other interesting topics along the way. Before we get to any of that, Mario, welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Excited to have a conversation. Continue the great chat we've been having. Yeah, absolutely. And prior to the chat, we had met briefly. I saw your session at the Global Talent Summit in Washington, D.C. at the Gallup headquarters. Really great session put together by Anna Rold and Kelly Ryan Bailey. Really interesting day yeah. as for me, just as a participant for you, you know, might have been even more of a whirlwind in that you were presenting. Mm -hmm. We'll get into some of yeah. what you're working on, which is uh, relevant on a number of fronts. But before we do that, we always like to start with guests' origin stories. How did you get to this point in your career? Can you catch us up on how you got to this point in your professional life? Yeah, in a very winding way. I come from a family where my dad's a classically trained visual artist. On my mom's side, I'm a fourth generation engineer. So like a very weird combination that expands those things. I studied robotics engineering and minored in business, but that definitely wasn't for me. It helped shape how I think for sure, which I really appreciate. But about halfway through, I really got into social entrepreneurship, thinking about the future of work, future of social media. And towards the end of my degree, I won a national competition in Canada for predicting the future of work in the year 2040. And as a result, I got picked up by a think tank in France. So I spent time studying the future of technology, how generations were changing, how we work. And, and yeah, I spent time on that. And along the way, I've always been really motivated by and driven by the fact that you asked about orange, origin stories. My relatives, like my family, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, like we'd hear these stories of them being very intellectual, impactful, civically-minded people. And so they're kind of our role models growing up. and as we kind of got older, it just graded on me more and more that this was what the world seemed to be like. The, it was the opposite of what the world was optimizing for, like thoughtful, learned, helpful were like the losers and the people who were winning were like the most agitated, ignorant, yeah. divisive possible voices. Hmm. And so I think like an underlying current also was like, how do we create a world where uh, we're actually empowering and elevating like the really thoughtful people who love to learn and are actually informed when they speak out? and are balanced and, mm -hmm. and thoughtful. And that's, it's always been like a very core motivation coming from what we saw in our family growing up. Yeah. And then that led to you founding with your brother, Readography, <laughs> which is the platform that you were demoing as part of the Global Talent Summit. And I just got another sneak peek at it's available at yeah. readocracy.com. Check it out there. Can you describe what led to you founding Readocracy, I guess, a few years ago? Yeah, I think it was this realization we had. We had a bit of a eureka moment. This is not our first startup. And we kind of along the way, we, we've kind of been playing in the knowledge management, knowledge recognition, signaling space for a while. And we just had this realization that sure, you can have research tools, annotation tools, but people tend to think of attention and the attention we invest in, in you know, a pretty silly way. We only think of it as advertising value or like data collection value mm -hmm. when can we use the time we invest as a metric of learning and commitment to a subject? And that kind of sent us down a path where we're kind of thinking, okay, this, this can be really impactful because one of, one of the fun stats we, we've kind of realized as we've been working on this, people spend so much time online uh, with content. It's like about seven hours online around the world is the average. Americans spend about 13 hours of media every day, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the conversations around that. And so over the course of your life, you will spend as much time consuming content and discussing that content as you would studying for about four college degrees, especially if you're a knowledge worker. And most of us have nothing to show for that. And so we, yeah, we got really motivated by like, okay, what if that time counted? What if you could make um, that ridiculous amount of time committed to certain subjects and discussions around them and everything around that? What if you could make it count more like a degree? What would that do for people? Right. Right. And that gets into the credentialing space and the changes that are happening there, or at least some of the awakening that has been going on around the return on investment around a four-year degree, the idea that a lot of people mm -hmm. have some college, but no degree. And then on the other side, there are these skills gaps emerging where organizations are having a really hard time finding folks who can signal, getting back to your point about signaling, signal that they're actually 
ready to succeed at the job. Can you talk about that ecosystem and maybe you know, what it was modeled on back in the 20th century? And then we can lean into a little more about how you're looking to reinvent some of that. Yeah, I think there's just one core idea which really helps shift how we see things. We're, we're very used to thinking that the way things are now is just how it just makes sense. But in fact, the current education system we have is designed in a pre-internet era. There's a lot of parallels, interesting parallels you can draw between journalism and academia and education. So the internet liberated our access to information. And there were gatekeepers to that information. A lot of them were in media. So like if you want to get information, you have to get it from a certain news source. And also the gatekeepers of academia. So you have to like go somewhere to learn it. And it's so interesting because journalism, unfortunately, got like really swept away with this flood of access. They lost their moat. Mm -hmm. But academia still has the credentialing moat. So basically, we've liberated our access to information, but we haven't updated how we value our relationship to information. We still have to go back to this like thousand year old model of manual verification. In this fast moving world, you still got to go to this like very contrived four year, two year program. Mm -hmm. Like it's very, it's like oddly disconnected. And so I think that's just like a very important distinction to draw. And I think the big difference happens if you can think of new ways of assessing and verifying and presenting your relationship to learning without relying on manual review or like an institutional intervention, that essentially liberates the learning value of the internet, which I think is so important because when the internet came along, especially like a modern web, it was like, oh, this is going to allow the whole world to learn. But we didn't think about the fact that that's great maybe for intellectual curiosity and just informing people. But in terms of economic mobility and how you signal your learning, we're still stuck. Those same people right. still need to go spend an arm and a leg. They still need to go travel somewhere. They need to be part of the right group. And so like the impact side of that learning is stunted. So I think I'm like fascinated by how you bridge that gap and rethink it. Yeah, it's really interesting if you think also about the moat and how we're still thinking about the ivory tower, you know, kind of the yeah. traditional credentialing model as where genuine learning happens. The flip side is, you know, if you look at the democratization and removal of gatekeepers, it's allowed for some of the real negative components of yes. social media yes. and misinformation, disinformation to make our learning be low value. You know, we're consuming the equivalent of fast food, junk food, or mm -hmm. worse, yeah. if you allow the nutritional metaphor. Can you talk yeah. more about that? How do you validate not just that the person is actually reading this stuff and actually benefiting from it, but also that the source that they're gathering their informal learning from is still valid in some ways. How are you addressing that? Totally. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it's such a big part of redocracy because redocracy is when we think about rethinking learning, it's in a very broad social sense. Of course, it touches on how we think about schooling, but it's really about how do you signal trust? How do you indicate to somebody that they should trust you on a subject? And that applies just as much to an employer deciding if they should hire you as it does to us deciding who should get attention online. Mm -hmm. And the issue now is that in our current online ecosystem, exactly, like it has liberated it but without any context. We don't have context on who we should trust. And if anything, the only indicators we get of who we should trust is optimized for hysteria and volume, right? So the importance of a system like this is not just for, you know, giving people new ways of indicating what they're credible on for school and work, but it's also giving us as internet users a new way of being motivated to be thoughtful consumers, motivated to prove that we're informed and better assessing who we should trust. And so like with Redocracy, we talk a lot about the concept of infobesity because you can draw a very tight contrast between the obesity epidemic and the issues we have around how we feed our bodies, mm. but also the issues we have around how we feed our minds. So right now, the internet, these platforms are, we spend hours every day, and these platforms are basically like a buffet that you spend hours at that's designed to make you gorge yourself without thinking about it. Mm. Like their whole thing is like, we don't want you to think about it. And so you're absolutely right though. You know, there, we need this context and we need this value and consequence and reward to have that conceptual friction to think twice about what we consume 
and get that context. So with Redocracy, like more specifically, first of all, we plug into multiple databases that are focused exclusively on mapping polarization and misinformation. So you can't just get credit for anything. And if you're on a known source of misinformation, it flags it for you and you can find out why it's completely transparent. You can see the methodology, you can see why something was flagged. It's not just, you know, we're not the arbiters of truth and neither are our partners. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, like having insights, right? Like when it comes to our physical diet, we have so much context we're given and we're so conditioned you know you see a burger or a picture of a salad you think of calorie counts you think of the offset you'll have to do with your fitbit and the steps you take and all this kind of stuff and then with our information we have like none of that so you know as part of redocracy not only is the signally component outwardly but inwardly we also give you insights that we like to say are like a fitbit for information diet so you can see you know the quality of what you're consuming in terms of how much of it was agitating you deliberately what was the emotion that was coming out affecting you? How is your bias shifting? You know, what are the hidden patterns of influence? And these are just like very important pieces because again, coming full circle to your point, when you liberate the access and anybody can be quote unquote influential, not having any friction or way to be thoughtful around it can be very dangerous. Yeah. And I did like the UI elements that made this look a little bit like a Fitbit or a Strava for mm -hmm. my brain, which I know is something mm -hmm. that, that y'all are, are working on. That's beneficial really on both sides of the employment ecosystem as well, where it's beneficial for the organization to understand who can we hire into these roles, who has the skills and competencies ready for that next thing. But then also for the individual, you start to understand where am I getting my best return on my informal learning time? I would of course advocate for listening to a lot of trending in education, but our listeners are already doing yeah. that. What does this all mean when we start thinking about the, the skills gap and the future of work and where folks mm -hmm. can start taking a little more ownership of how they chart their path towards uh, career prospects and future yeah. endeavors that are ultimately in their best interest? I think there's two ways of looking at it. One is in the here and now, which is how do you present yourself? Degrees and certificates can actually be you know, handcuffs in a way, they, they limit how people see you. And this is why when you look online, not only have we spent all this money going through this traditional kind of old school system to prove ourselves, but then it's rapidly outdated. So you have all these people on LinkedIn, you have all these people on Twitter, you have people making newsletters just so they can posture around a subject to prove their credibility and maintain that credibility. The degree is getting outdated or whatever is getting outdated. And it's also expensive. So they do this. So the here and now bit, there's a tremendous opportunity for people to be helped in presenting their commitment and credibility on a subject, right? And yes, you can do that in this kind of more high friction way of posting on LinkedIn, putting on Twitter, setting up a newsletter. But what we're trying to think with Redocracy is, again, how do you essentially, if you've done the work and you're actually learning on the relevant subject, how do you signal that and hold a mirror to that mm -hmm. um, that is continuous and helps you show it without having to like do these very like narrow extra energy efforts to show it? So I think that's one part. Like when people think of the future of work and especially the trend that people are becoming much more atomized and self-representative and there's much more, even for knowledge workers, I think there was a stat saying something like 84% of knowledge workers are thinking about freelance. More and more knowledge workers are thinking about themselves as independent workers, even if they're in a company. So I think like you have to be thoughtful about how you present yourself. And I think it's important to have, to be thoughtful about what we think of as knowledge branding, yeah. how you present knowledge. The, the other side of it is I think just like the, the gap in the labor market. So this is more future oriented, but as we move in that direction where knowledge workers are the new front of freelance workers and gig workers, which has been usually confined to designers, coders, like cheap labor. As you get to that, we already have this issue where there's a gap between supply and demand. And I think getting to having more data and a more authentic and continuous representation of what people are passionate about and recognizing that passion in a more fluid way will allow people to get labor opportunities and for people to fill labor need better. So like with Redocracy, we're working on the vision for us, what we're building into is having a data-driven knowledge marketplace, where if you go in, you say, I need somebody who knows, is like totally into neuroscience, but also business strategy. And it's going to pull up somebody who's read tremendously on the subject, has contributed very high value stuff, discussions with people I've read about it, have some work outputs attached to it, and you're ready to go. And they have the prices list and everything. You know, what that can do to fill this disconnect that exists I think is like very high potential. And there's other platforms in the Web3 space that are edging around this as well. So I think around the future, that's going to be necessary as we get to more hybrid work models, work becomes more and more independent. If we're in this free flow of information and this rapidly moving market, we need 
indicators and signaling mechanisms are just as fluid and nimble. And I think that's going to be like an essential ingredient for the future of work. And, and also just like showing who you are and your uniqueness, because as we start using AI a lot and a lot of the menial labor is replaced, you know, what makes you special is going to be, you know, it's already valuable today. I think it's just going to become even more valuable. You touched on it a little bit there. One of the themes that came out of the Global Talent Summit that we were at was Web3 and the blockchain and AI is the other component of mm -hmm. Web3 and what's emerging that's interesting. As someone who's led successful startups and is staying fluent in what's emerging in the world of technology and the world of learning, looking out ahead, you won an award for thinking about 2040, and that was even a couple of years ago. So maybe you're ready to talk yeah. 2043 now, but um, <laughs> what, do, what do you see on the horizon? Where do you see if we extend forward? I think the good futurist thinking is put some scenarios out there. We're not necessarily 100% confident which thing will unfold, but just looking ahead, thinking about scenarios and uh, really the future of work, the future of learning. Are there any trends you're noticing now that you see taking shape in interesting ways in the coming years? Yeah, there's a few. So on the blockchain front, I'm generally like a first principles kind of skeptic around the whole space. So I, there's definitely value there for more on the industrial scale. Like a lot of stuff around crypto and tokens to me is, yeah, I, don't, I won't get into it. But, but when it comes to DAOs, like decentralized autonomous organizations and how people share the power and share the ownership and the wealth, you know, until now they've flamed out because power was assigned by people basically buying their way, like they they buy a lot of tokens and so they have power or they just like win through volume. They do like activity that gets them a lot of power in, in like one of these organizations. I think it's interesting, again, to think about how we assign power. If you are going to have a self-organized organization or community, are you assigning it through just like another means of financial metrics or are you going to do it being a bit biased here, but are you going to do it through how somebody has proven that they're informed, like at the crossover, the intersection of learning. So is power assigned because you've proven that you're very committed and knowledgeable on the subject that decides the future of this organization? I'd be like a much better metric. So I think it's interesting to see how we find new ways of assigning power in these ways that are on the blockchain self-organized. On the AI front, I think it's so interesting. There's so many things we could talk about. One of them, assessments. So you already see with GPT-3 and tools, tools built on top of it, the ability to speak to experts as if they're there with you yeah. and generate multiple, like answer questions. And so the ability of using that to start generating assessments based on somebody's learning time mm -hmm. and not even need a manual intervention anymore. Again, the ability to scale that, to check the boxes of what traditional institutions consider their like acceptable credentials and not having a need for the institution anymore. It's like fascinating. Right, like when you just use AI to do those assessments. Yeah. And then lastly, what I think is interesting, and I think most people should be doing, this new wave of AI is not like the AI before. And you're seeing tangibly how it's going to impact so many professions, especially knowledge workers and creative workers. And most of the interfaces require you to think like the AI in a way. It's hard to describe, but if you're, if anybody's just tried the AI image generators, whether it's DALI or Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion, like you start to realize it's like the prompt training. You have to be get good at prompts. You have to get good at, and so I think that's something that is a way of thinking and a way of interacting with the future of, when we talk about the future of work, I think this will be a layer that exists everywhere in the future of work and will be part of our jobs. And so I think that's something that people should be playing around with because it's a way of thinking that is different and I think is going to be interwoven into how we work in the future. Yeah, it's super interesting. I've heard it described as AI literacy, where just a, yeah. a basic yeah. understanding and also more of a hands-on maker's mindset as it relates to emerging technology. You know, even if you're skeptical about NFTs, you maybe built mm -hmm. one just so you know what it is. And if you're exactly you're yeah, trying totally. to understand this image generation, I was just playing around with it. You know, maybe we'll come up with some representation of this conversation to go with this podcast episode. We're about to wrap up here as we're concluding. You know, I always like to give guests an opportunity to reinforce takeaways or, or anything that folks coming away from this conversation should maybe continue to think about. Any closing thoughts, closing comments from you as we wrap up here? Yeah, just that how you inform yourself matters. And if we look at the problems in the world today, whether it's people getting left behind by the education system or a world which seems to be very prone to misinformation and agitation, 
you should just really think about what's the consequence of not having more rewards or motivation or thoughtfulness around how you inform yourself. And it's important to be more mindful, whether you use Redocracy or something else, just that central thought of how you inform yourself matters. Let that stick with you and think about that. Yeah. And always be learning and be wide ranging in the sources from which you might learn. It's not just in the lecture hall. It's also on websites, in PDFs, on YouTube. Yes. On podcasts, yes. of course. Yep. Uh, yep. And it was wonderful having you as part of today's show. Mario Vasilescu, the co founder and CEO of Readocracy. Thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thank you very much. This is great. Really appreciate it. Awesome. And hopefully, our listeners enjoyed as much as I did. We'll be back again soon. Subscribe, rate, and review. Do all the good things. This is Trending in Education.